Ladies and gentlemen, lords, ladies and gentlemen, actually, uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Simon Innitt, I'm chairman of the Independent Transport Commission, and my duty today is very simple. It's to do three things. It's to thank certain people for making sure that this event could take place. It's to uh, introduce the agenda and the order of play. And it's to just start the process rolling with just a very brief introduction as to what we're here and to try and, trying to achieve this evening. Starting with thanks, well, first of all, I'd like to thank the Science Museum for agreeing to host this event on our behalf in the shadow of Rocket, Apollo 10, etc., these great transport icons that you can see after the event. I'd certainly like to sp thank the speakers, but Doug uh, the chairman of the Science Museum will be doing that right at the end, so I won't spend a lot of time on that, though the, the, the thanks are undoubtedly and heartfelt. I'd certainly like to thank our sponsors, uh, without whom, on the back of the programme, you can see who sponsors the ITC, uh, without whom none of this could ever be achieved. And I'd certainly like to thank uh, our Secretary General, Matthew Niblett, and his team for making sure this all happened. The order of play is very straightforward. Uh, after I've uh, moved on, uh, the Minister, Stephen Hammond, will just say a few work words and introduce the speakers. The speakers will speak on the subject which you have in front of you. And uh, then Doug Gurr, as I've said, the chairman of the Science Museum, will say a few words to conclude. We hope to conclude the speech, event, the lecture, within about an hour, and then there'll be an hour for drinks afterwards, if that's what you choose to do. Just to set this whole thing in context, um, we all have our day jobs and we all have our pressures of our day jobs, passenger numbers, orders, CSR for certain of those people from the department uh, present, uh, I'm sure is, is bearing down on them. And the ITC indeed has its day job. In normal term, times we publish uh, research pieces. <coughs> Uh, on uh, major issues of the moment. So, for example, recently, at the tail end of last year, our own Peter Jones, uh, with uh, the uh, sponsored by ORR, uh, ourselves, and RAC Foundation, sponsored a piece on, called On the Move about how potentially, fundamentally, patterns of trans travel are changing, land-based travel are changing in this, in this country. About uh, a month ago, a bit under that, Stephen Hickey and other our commissioners led a piece of work on uh, aviation and what we should do to answer the capacity issues in the southeast of England. We actually kicked this off before Howard Davis was even considered, or maybe after he was considered, but before he was announced. Uh, but, uh, 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 and it was therefore rather flattering in the context of all the, the things that have been spoken on this subject that. Uh, when we published our report, it achieved uh, the third most hit item on BBC News uh, on that Wednesday morning, and it has had a significant impact. Right now, we are planning a piece of work to address the High Speed 2 issue. We're having uh, consultative groups around the country trying to work out whether High Speed 2 uh, will uh, contribute to local economies or whether or not it will suck the talent of local economies into that black hole which is London, and if it's not to do that, encouraging local communities, uh, local cities, city clusters, to think about what they need to do to make sure that they get advantage from it rather than uh, see it deprive them of their lifeblood. But this is an opportunity to lift one's mind above the immediate and look to the future, uh, and to look uh, to uh, dramatic events that might happen. In about a week's time, on the 3rd of July, I suppose two weeks' time, I will be with Paul Kirkman, also in the audience, director of the uh, Railway Museum, uh, to commemorate the 75th anniversary of Mallard hitting the speed limit, uh, the, the speed record on steam. At about the same time, in rugby, Frank Whittle, was developing the next generation of technology, the jet engine, which was going to tra transplant the high-speed train, which had previously uh, generated the massive growth in long-distance travel. The jet engine was the next. It is just possible that in 25 years, when we commemorate the 100th anniversary of those uh, conjoined events, 
that we will be able to look at the possibility of fusion making its first impact on transforming the, the future of uh, travel by providing effectively a free, pollution-free form of electricity and therefore power for many of our needs, but particularly transport. And it's that that we've come here to debate, uh, to listen to Steve Cowley and Richard Barry Jones, uh, consider the possibilities that that might offer us. So, without further ado, maybe I could pass across to the Minister who will introduce those two gentlemen uh, and say a few words before they address us this evening. Simon, thank you very much. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm delighted to be asked to be here this evening uh, to give uh, a few introductory remarks and what I hope will become a long-standing series of uh, annual, annual lectures from the Independent Transport Commission. It's particularly appropriate that this inaugural event, of course, is being held here, kindly hosted at the Science Museum, which is world famous. And as Simon rightly pointed out, if you wandered through, the, glo the UK's global reputation was built in the 18th and 19th centuries on the bedrock of innovation, on the bedrock of science, technology and transport. And around us, of course, in the museum, uh, as we look around at the innovations in trains, from Stevenson's rocket to the very successful solar-powered racing car designed by some students, uh, a truly unique collection of science and technology comparable with any in the world. Innovations in travel and science have enabled us to move and communicate in ways that have brought the world closer and closer together and opened up uh, connections that hitherto were thought impossible. Um, Britain should be rightly proud of the role that British science has played in these advances, from the railways to the World Wide Web. And today we need to build on that reputation and look to the future. And we need to look to the future if Britain is to remain at the forefront of global innovation. Because it is that innovation that will be the driver for economic growth, and it will be that that is the driver to help uh, improve the nation's prosperity. The Department for Transport is committed to playing its role in trying to encourage innovation and growth. We're investing in growth-promoting world-class transport systems through projects such as high-speed rail, cross-rail, as well as a huge capital investment in the roads at the time of an economic downturn uh, and cycleways airports. But we also have our eye firmly fixed on the medium to long term driving innovation through our support for R&D in low-carbon vehicles, driverless vehicle technology, the detection of threats to transport and cyber networks, to name just a few areas where the department is sponsoring uh, innovation. Well, generally, of course, like everyone, we're aware that increasing digital digitization of transport services will present enormous opportunities. I'm delighted to say we're already making good progress by moving many of our agencies such as the DVLA, to a new world of digital by default, offering customers a, 24, a 21st century experience and a 21st century service. So fresh thinking about our transport needs is always welcome. And therefore, I'm particularly grateful to the Independent Transport Commission for launching this series. I should pay tribute to them to the wide range of research and educational work that they do. What they carry out is welcome, is really welcome. Their work helps to make so many of us understand how best we should and can plan for the travel in the future. Uh, and this new lecture series is, I'm told, designed to encourage us to think about the future of travel and transport in fresh ways. And in that respect, the subject for tonight's event of the prospect of fusion energy and its effect on transport is obviously particularly important. We all recognise the importance of decarbonised energy sources for transport within the overall energy mix. It's a challenge and it will continue to be a challenge. In terms of reducing climate change impact, improving air quality and increasing the resilience of the energy supply. Quite clearly the increased use of electricity already underpins many of the transport developments both on road and rail. And the generation of this electricity is critical to its wider impacts and we need a broader approach. It's mainly an issue, or sometimes mainly considered an issue, for my colleagues at DEC, but we in the DFT recognise it has a huge impact 
and we have a clear interest in this. For example, the, few, the food versus fuel, the indirect land use challenge debates have highlighted some of the problems with biofuels and we're working hard to ensure that these are properly addressed at a European level. Nevertheless, biofuels have an important role in tackling climate change and may even continue to be needed in a fusion, a fusion future. For example, aviation and heavy goods vehicles. So tonight comes at, a, comes at an opportune moment. And it's a huge privilege for me to stand here today to welcome two such distinguished guest speakers. Professor Stephen Cowley will be well known to you as the Chief Executive of the UK Atomic Energy Authority, Director of the Cullum Centre for Fusion Energy. The research that Stephen directs is a great example of Britain leading the world in the investigation of the prospects for nuclear fusion energy. The prospect of an unlimited supply of carbon neutral energy would clearly revolutionise our energy situation and offer the holy grail of cheap carbon free energy with major ramifications for transport. Would we, for instance, move towards the electrification of transport more quickly? What would it look like? What would the prospect of a cheaper transport mean? Would we still want to travel more and more? It's a question. Uh, it's a fascinating question. Uh, and the question that uh, fusion energy can pose, as well as hopefully answering. I'm also delighted that we're also welcoming today Professor Richard Parry Jones, CBE, to consider these issues. Richard, as many of you know, is a world leading thinker in science and technology, having headed up the global research and development at Ford Motor Company, and now through his very valuable work as chairman of Network Rail. He's also a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineers, co chairman of the UK Automotive Council, uh, and Richard's understanding of transport uh, and the transport world is second to none. I hope that this inaugural lecture will be the first of many. And so, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to our distinguished speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. It's um, absolutely delightful to be here um, to talk about fusion energy. Um, we're looking at we're looking at a very inefficient fusion reactor, but a very successful one. Um, <laughs> the sun generates a few watts per meter cubed of fusion energy, but it's very large. <laughs> when um, when uh, Simon asked me to do this, um, I was uh, reminded of the two questions I get asked every time I talk about fusion. Um, one of them is very unwelcome, and one is very welcome. Uh, the one that's very unwelcome is um, the, wise, the wise guy who says, fusion energy is 30 years away and always will be. Um, and maybe there's some truth. Um, <laughs> and, and, and the one that I like much more, which is always, uh, if you were given an unlimited amount of uh, money, a la the Apollo space program, how quickly could you develop fusion energy? Um, I'm not going to address those problems quite head on in that sense, but I, I, what I'd like to say is when I think we'll get the first electricity from fusion energy, and I think that's not when it will make a commercial impact. Um, we've got a very clear idea now, I think, of the roadmap that's needed to actually deliver the first electricity. Um, that's not probably electricity quite at a cost you want to pay, but it never is with a prototype of a new technology. Um, am I supposed to stand? I'm probably supposed to take the uh, microphone. I pace around partly from nervousness, but um, um, so <clears throat> this is the Kitty Hawk, um, 17th of December, 1903. Four times that day, the Wright brothers' flyer flew. Um, and it is that kind of revolution in, in technology that you ask, how do you get this far? Um, and I g got some heart from this rather famous quote, actually, from Wilbur Wright, which says, I confess that in 1901 I said to my brother Orville that man would not fly for 50 years. Ever since, I've distrusted myself and avoided all predictions. <laughs> and of course, you know, I would say something like that because it sort of means that you, you don't know 
when critical um, changes in your understanding happen when you're this close to, uh, to something uh, really game-changing. But of course, th there's the other side of this, which if we go back to Sir George Cayley, who was really in, in many senses the, the father of aeronautics, um, uh, who, you know, in 1809 said he felt perfectly confident, however, that this noble art, flying, will soon be brought home to man's convenience and that we shall be able to transport ourselves and our families and their goods and chattels more securely by air than water and with a velocity of 20 to 100 miles per hour. Soon. Um, sorry, let's go back. He says soon. I think that's actually a word I would like to use because it's much easier to make those kind of predictions. Um, we can do fusion. We're very lucky in, in the UK is that we host, it's the largest European scientific infrastructure on British soil. It's a machine called JET, which is in my laboratory, which is uh, Cullum, just south of Oxford. Um, and this machine can reach the conditions for fusion and regularly does produce some fusion. So here, for instance, is a camera looking in the machine. Let's see, here it is. Um, camera looking in the machine as some fusion is going on. This is actually not full blast fusion from jet, but what you can see is the neutrons hitting the um, outside of the, uh, of the, the camera, given those speckledy white images, means that this inside here is a gas of deuterium at temperatures of about 100 or 150 million degrees. That's precisely what you need to be able to do fusion. Um, so when people say, when are you going to do fusion, that's really not the question. The question is, when are you going to do fusion at a cost and scale in which you can deliver electricity? Um, the reaction that we want to do, sorry, it's a little nuclear physics, and I know it's late in the day for nuclear <laughs> physics, but <laughs> you'll have to forgive me. The reaction that we want to do is between uh, two isotopes of hydrogen. So this is deuterium, which is heavy hydrogen, which is one proton and a neutron, and this is tritium which is one proton and two neutrons. Um, and this is by far the easiest reaction to do. We've got to do fusion much more efficiently than the sun, and so we have to use this easiest reaction to do it. Um, if you bring deuterium and tritium together, you have to ram them together at incredible speeds. They will stick and form for an instance something called helium-5, and the normal helium will split off and a neutron will come out. And you can arrange for that neutron to hit lithium, and the lithium splits into tritium and helium again, and you take that tritium and you put it back in here because tritium does not exist in nature. Um, so the fuels for fusion are deuterium and lithium. There is enough deuterium to power the world for 60 billion years, and there won't be a planet in 60 billion years. Um, there's enough lithium in seawater for 30 million years. So that alone tells you that it's worth a darn good try at making this work. Um, the results from JET, um, we did a classic um, campaign in 1997. It was the first time we'd ever put tritium in the machine. Normally we run just with deuterium so that we don't actually get any fusion reactions. Um, but in 1997 we introduced uh, tritium in the machine, and this is time along the bottom, and this is fusion power up here, and we generated about 16 megawatts of fusion power for about two seconds. Now, at these powers, that actually was not um, the shot on which we model the future, because it went up and it came right back down again. Um, we can run for about five seconds at full power, so this shot, for instance, at 4.5 megawatts for five seconds shows that we can raise the temperature to about 200 million degrees, hold it there, get a fusion uh, reaction going, and turn it off. Now, in this case, we were putting in about 24 megawatts of power. So 24 plus 16 means that it was about 40 megawatts of power coming out of the device at that time. But we were only generating 16 megawatts. Recent results, in 2008, we discovered a new way to run JET. And we've done a series of modifications of JET. And we're going to run Tritium again in 2015-16. And what we think is that we will be able to hit around 20 megawatts of power for this time with about a one-to-one -one ratio of energy in to energy out during that time. Um, I'm trying to push the team to go to see 
go all out for a one-to-one -one ratio, but I think that that's a roughly where we'll end up during this time. But 20 megawatts, as opposed to 4.5 for a full sustained period, will be a major step forward. But it's not actually the scientific proof that we'll be able to do fusion. So we're building a device in southern France. This is ITER. It's being built, um, it's a nice place to put an experiment, actually. It's near Aix-en-Provence. Um, the, the, there were two places competing for this, um, for this experiment. One was in northern Japan and one was in Provence. And you know which one I was voting for. Um, th this device is a, um, an international collaboration between these seven partners. Um, we are represented by the European Commission, so the UK is contributing through the European Commission. It's almost exactly twice the size of JET, exactly modelled on the results that we achieved in JET in Oxfordshire. Right? From those results, we're extrapolating for, to the performance of this machine. The goal of the machine, the official goal of the machine, is half a gigawatt of power for more than 400 seconds. Um, but let me show you what some of the latest calculations suggest we will achieve. So I need to explain a little bit here. Um, this is time along the bottom. What you do at time t equals zero here is you introduce the fuel into the machine. The big powerful magnetic fields hold the fuel in place and you start to pass a current of electric current through the plasma. It, the gas heats up to about 10 million degrees here. Then you turn on these big heaters. This indicates power is being poured into the plasma by bombarding it with particles. Plasma is just a hot gas in this case, hot ionized gas. 70 megawatts goes in and suddenly the fusion power, this is a simulation, a computer simulation of ITER's performance, shoots up to about 500 megawatts. And you can see these little oscillations inside because it's a very sophisticated computer simulation of exactly what will happen. Then you step down the input power to 50. So this is your match, 70 megawatts. You've lit the fire, goes down to about 50 megawatts, goes out to 400 seconds, and then you turn off completely your heating source. And at this point, and this is what we, we've constructed ITER for, it just burns. It produces 500 megawatts of fusion power with no power in. This is the holy grail of fusion research. This is self-sustained fusion. You've lit the fire, you just put in the fuels, deuterium and tritium, and it burns away, pouring out half a, a gigawatt of fusion power. This is industrial scale. It's exactly what you would need to actually produce some electricity. Of course, the, the exp it's an experiment. So we don't know for certain that it'll produce that. And you can see different simulations on here where we made some assumptions about things that could go wrong and it wouldn't achieve this. But if we achieve this, you can't ever say again that fusion power is not possible. What you could possibly say, though, is that we don't know yet whether it's cost effective. Um, that is really the goal that we have to take up in these next um, decade or so in, in the UK. Um, we will be operating JET until about 2020. And then ITER will come on and it will essentially usurp our position as the leading fusion research establishment in the world. Um, at that point, our goal is to become the first place to design the first electricity producing power plant. Um, and we are hoping that we'll be able to persuade the European Commission, who fund most of our research, to fund the UK to be the lead on that. And this is a conceptual design of what that would be. This is a 1.4 gigawatt fusion power plant, um, would replace a typical PWR, like the ones that we're about to construct. Um, it would have um, a lot of technology that we have never built yet. Because even building ITER, we don't have the technology to take the fusion power and turn it into electricity. So this we call DEMO, the demonstration reactor. And the plan is that Europe puts this on by 2040, a little less than 30 years away um, from now. Um, in 2040, and that it would be producing some electricity before the middle of the century. Now, I'd like to do better than this, because frankly, it's very big, and development of this is going to cost a lot of money to do. 
And I think that one of the goals that we have in our research in this country is to try and reduce the cost and the scale of this step. If doing this step costs 25 billion to build one of these things, it's going to be very hard to develop fusion energy. And so one of the things we're focusing on in our program is systematically working through this, how can we reduce the size, the cost, the scale, everything, so we can produce something that we can get to market much quicker. Um, this is not so much of a concern of our competitors. There are um, two competitors who are very gung-ho about getting first electricity. Um, they're partners in ITER. This is Korea and China. Um, and I was just over in China in um, December, and uh, they've invited us to join them in building their first electricity producing reactor, which they're hoping to get on in the early 2030s. Um, the Koreans, this is the Koreans' timeline right here. The Koreans, the South Korea, of course, we're not talking about North Korea. Um, <laughs> the Koreans' timeline, this is the official, um, this is then National Fusion uh, Lab, um, is to have their first electricity power generation by 2036. Um, these are both countries, China and uh, Korea, that have very little um, intrinsic energy um, and a great need to produce uh, carbon-free sources for the future. One of the problems for China is that it has such a huge demand that even fast breeder fission reactors will not scale up fast enough to meet the demand. And one of the advantages, if you can get fusion working on this time scale, would be that you, you can build fusion power stations and you don't have to prepare for them long in advance. So, if you can make them work. So this is essentially what our competitors are thinking about. They're going to try and beat Europe by about a decade. Um, is it competitive? Now, it's very difficult to assess whether the cost of electricity from something that this that, that we've never built will be. And the thing that dominates cost of electricity is the availability of the plant. And we don't know at this point exactly what kind of accidents and, and downtime, etc., would happen in that plant. So predicting the cost is difficult, but we've made a very good stab at that. The engineers have looked at that design and said, you know, what would it cost in construction? What would be the discount rate we'd expect? All these things to try and predict future cost of the, of the electricity. And we get, elect this is combined cycle gas turbines, fission, wind. This is the cost, an upper bound and a lower bound on what we think the electricity. Now you know I'm a fusion advocate, so you can take this with a slight pinch of salt. Um, but on the other hand, um, what I would say is that it comes in the ballpark. It isn't that we have a technology that just scales to unbelievable cost of electricity. We have a technology that with the right kind of engineering could come in at a cost comparable to the other ones. And of course the cost here is in the construction of the plants, which presumably over time would get cheaper. We've taken a tenth of a kind cost here, so we've looked at some learning in the process um, from this. Um, but as I say, what we would like to do is bring down the cost and the scale. Very difficult to develop a technology if you need seven international partners every time you make a step. Right? Much easier if you can do it in a garage in Palo Alto. Um, it's clear that you can't do it in a garage in Palo Alto, but we would like to bring down the cost and scale. Um, and uh, we are about to finish building this device at Cullum, which is a device which will get about half the performance of jet. Jet at today's prices would be about a billion and a half to build. This device has cost us 30 million to build. Um, about half the performance of jet in a much more compact shape. If you remember the picture of um, ITER, you could barely see the European sized person standing by it, and there's the uh, British sized person standing by our machine. Um, and the idea here is to produce a confinement and a device that's much smaller and more compact. If we can take this device forward, and one of the problems we're having at the moment is how do we use superconductors in this case. If we can take it forward, then we will be able to produce much more compact future reactors, and hopefully this will take over after the ITER step. It's clear we have to do the ITER step. We have to show that we can sustain a fusion reaction and produce net amounts of power, etc. Um, but this will help us produce power at a cost you want to pay for your electricity. 
I thought I'd show you an actual plasma in this. Um, this is looking inside the precursor to that device, which is called MAST, and you can see the plasma uh, at that point. One of the things about this plasma is it spins at supersonic speeds, and this provides part of the very good confinement that it does. It's new innovation. It's moving forward. I'm hoping that we'll beat the Chinese and the Koreans to the punch. Thank you. I'm sure like you, uh, like me rather, you found that ext extremely fascinating. And I, I learned a lot in a very short period of time there. Very promising. Now, my, what's my job this evening? I think my job is to provide a build bridge, a tenuous bridge perhaps, between what uh, Steve has, t has told us and transport. And uh, I'm going to do that by speculating about the future. Somebody might ask me, you know, what, uh, what's going to happen as a result of fusion power in transport? And the answer is, of course, I don't know. But that's not the same thing as I don't have a clue. So join me in a journey of speculation uh, about the implications of this. Um, so let's think for about the fundamentals for a moment. What's the mission of transport? It's about improving quality of life. It's about enabling economic growth. It's a catalyst for economic growth and quality of life improvement. How does it do that? It, re it allows us to relocate goods, raw materials, semi-processed materials, partly finished goods, components and systems, and of course, finished goods for the end consumer. But it also relocates people. It moves people to added value locations, for example, places where they can do some work. It also allows people to access services, for example, hospitals. And we'll talk a bit more about trends in that in a few seconds. So if it were true, that fusion power were to come along and make energy uh, far more uh, affordable and indeed uh, far more environmentally sustainable, then it would potentially have huge implications on transport and in turn huge implications on society, on the economy. So what's happening to transport demand? Uh, and what's causing those changes in transport demand? Well, we see mobility demand roughly proportional to GDP per capita. And there doesn't really seem to be much of a break in that correlation. There are occasional blips, but fundamentally that correlates quite well. We see a huge trend towards urbanization. Population shifts towards uh, megacities and urbanization, uh, not only in developing, uh, in developing countries, but also in the developed countries. We see ongoing population growth. My remarks, incidentally, are main, mainly about the world. Uh, I'll occasionally allude to the UK. But this, this, these happen to be trends that are true also for the UK. We see a shifting economic mix in manufacturing to services in the developed economies and, of course, agriculture to manufacturing in the developing economies. Huge implications of that on transport. And we see the growth of digital services as a means of accessing uh, services and retail. And we see a trend towards centralization of specialist services because we can provide better quality services at lower cost by centralizing them. That, of course, implies the need to access them. So there are all those trends on the left-hand side of this slide. Now let's look at the consequences. The first and ob most obvious one is congestion. Congestion on the key trunk routes, congestion in urban areas. Demand management and fiscal policy is the natural short-term follow-up to that. There are one or two disadvantages for trying to manage this congestion through demand management, mainly about quality of life and economic growth. So only a short-term tactical solution. We see a significant modal shifts uh, to mass transit and car sharing, obviously mainly in the urban areas and in the intercity routes. We see, interestingly, and this is partly that manufacturing to services shift, big shifts in the freight goods volume agglomerating at ports and being transported inland from those ports to the distribution centers. And rail has played a huge role in enabling that, and road provides the last link to the consumer or distribution center. We see a huge increase in freight parcel growth. That's the digital online shopping. We see a little less casual traffic. That's not true in all countries, but it's certainly true in some. And what we see because of these uh, centralized services is the need for more access, often 
for the most vulnerable in society who don't have their own uh, automatic means of transport. And we see digital working becoming more important because we can now work while we're traveling. So those modes of transport that offer the opportunity to be productive while you're traveling tend to become more competitive and more attractive to buyers than those which don't, which offer productivity disadvantages. The obvious example there is traveling in a train versus having to drive a car. It is generally frowned upon to be doing your digital work while you're driving a car. So, there are some of the consequences. Now let's have a look at what the challenges are. Safety, first and foremost. Sustainability. Current transport systems are not, are not as safe as they need to be and they're not as sustainable. Emissions, air quality. Not only carbon uh, dioxide for global warming, but equally importantly, city air quality. Particulates in particular. Congestion we've covered. Growth. Need for more, more and more capacity. Providing better and better value for customers. That's what every other industry does to grow. That's what the transport industry needs to do. Ever increasing value. And of course, providing ever improving quality. And the thing that's very interesting about this list is there are no trade-offs. You have to do them all simultaneously. Because that's what our customers want. So, there are our challenges down the left-hand side. You've probably got the hang of this by now, this presentation. <laughs> so on the right-hand side, we're going to build up some of the responses. And I'm going to talk about all of the responses and then classify them into a couple of different uh, bins. Automation is the major countermeasure that's going to improve safety. Efficiency and alternative fuels will start to address sustainability, alternative sources of energy. Clean propulsion technologies. Intelligent transport systems will address congestion and capacity. And as a result of all of the above, lower operating costs and better capacity utilization will lower, improve value for money. Now, color code. These green selections from the prior list on the right hand side are the things that I think are going to be primarily impacted by what I'll describe as the fusion energy revolution. But it's very important that we consider what's going to happen in the meantime, and that's the digital revolution. Because the digital revolution has revolutionized our communications, as we all know. Our ability to access information has been transformed in the last 20 years. But actually, the digital revolution hasn't even begin to, begun to touch transport just yet. But in the next 20 years, it's going to. And I think you need to look at the impact of fusion power in combination with the impact of digital revolution to understand the full scope of the transformation that's going to occur in the transport region. So let's have a look at the digital revolution. And by the digital revolution, what do I mean? I mean high bandwidth mobile communications and process the processing revolution. See what it says down here on the asterisk? Infinite and free. Now, it won't quite be infinite, and it won't quite be free, but it'll be very close. And the other key word on this slide at the moment is mobile. 4G LTE and 5G are just the beginning. We're going to be able to stream enormous amounts of data in real time in mobile applications within 10 to 15 years. And we better be planning for it. So what will it lead to? Increasingly autonomous vehicle control. Most vehicles already possess some level of autonomous control. Any car with ABS has already got a computer interfering with your uh, foot actions. Because if you press the brake pedal too hard for the amount of grip available, the computer will say, uh-oh, driver doesn't know what they're doing, but I know what they, they desire. I will modify the signal they're providing to the brake pedal and create a safe version of their signal to create a safe solution in the vehicle behavior. That level of autonomy is just increasing. It's not going to happen overnight. We're going to have driverless cars tomorrow morning. But system by system, function by function, autonomous control is taking over our vehicles. And not just cars. All kinds of vehicles. Increasingly high precision vehicle traffic control on all networks. And by high precision, I'm talking about to the meter. Platooning and virtual coupling will become the norm. 
very high capacity utilization, sometimes 10 times as many vehicles on the same network, whether it's rail or road, the throughput will vastly increase because we can get more efficient allocation and we can close up headways. You cannot allow drivers to drive at 100 miles an hour on the M1 in the outside lane a meter apart. They're just, humans just aren't good enough, but a computer can completely safely. So we'll end up with zero accidents in any transport mode and indeed in any combination of transport modes, as I'll go on to illustrate with a couple of examples. Very much higher private car occupant productivity because now the car's driving itself so we can get around with our digital work and we're connected with very high bandwidth. And very large reductions in the cost of public transport because we can take out a lot of the labor costs involved and we can also schedule them more efficiently. So, let's have a look at um, a couple of different modes and what that might mean. Let's look at cars as a robot, because that's what they're going to become. They can conduct, can you imagine a car that is autonomously controlled? You're probably thinking about a car where you're sitting in it reading a newspaper and it's driving itself. Well, if it's safe enough to do that, it's surely safe enough for us to drive itself around without you in the car and do all your errands for you. Go and get your shopping. Go and collect your online shopping. Go and get itself washed. Get itself refueled or recharged. Get itself serviced. The self looking after, it, looking after itself car. Optimal routing for autonomous ta task list execution. So, you need to pick up the kids from school, you need to visit the uh, sick mother in hospital, you need to do some shopping. Let me have a look at the optimal route for that. And at night, the car will go out and fetch your shopping from the warehouse, picking the optimal uh, piece of road at the optimal time for its network allocation. End-to-end, multimodal journey execution. So I can basically go online, get a ticketless uh, uh, booking, and a vehicle will turn up outside my house, transport me to the station, put me in the train, train will get to its destination, another autonomous vehicle meet me at the station, take me to my final destination. Seamless. Now what that does is challenges ownership models. So now we're starting to think about what we're providing now with transport is a service, simply a service. We don't need to own these cars. In fact, by owning them, we're underutilizing their economic value. Most of the time, they're not being used if we own them. If we rent them, and they're autonomously controlled, so that's very easy nowadays, much more economically attractive because the utilization is so much higher. And I suspect a growth of the sort of multi-purpose vehicle market because that will allow us to service shared um, destinations. Two or three people in a similar area can lower their costs further by automatic routing and optimal route selection with an autonomous guided vehicle. So just a few examples of a few things that might change if it were true. Let's think about the train. Virtual coupling we've already covered and big reductions in train headways. The intelligent railway. Direct peer-to-peer -peer train communications, very high-speed communications, reliable communications, train to infrastructure, train talking to the level crossings, to the points. Infrastructure to train, problem, we can tell the train. Train to road, bilateral communications, I'm approaching a level crossing, autonomous vehicle approaching a level crossing, talk to each other, and just as cars will avoid each other in a, cross, in a crossroads, so trains and cars can avoid each other on a level crossing. Train to track worker. If there's a train coming, we need to warn the track worker, give the track worker a transponder so they know what's happening. Train to pedestrian cyclist. We can even, if you're listening to your iPod or your iPhone, on your music, on your headphones, and you're wandering towards a pedestrian crossing or across a railway, we'll interrupt you. We'll put your music on mute and say, <coughs> excuse me, you need to check out for the trains because we know exactly where you are, to the meter. And the train's talking to the iPhone or whatever the future iPhone is. Big data, shared big data rail services, smart ticketing, asset management, integrated responses, customized consumer information and services. For example, we know you've got a reservation on the Cambridge to London train at 8.01. We also know it's been delayed, probably a network rail infrastructure fairly somewhere. It's being delayed by, let's say, uh, 15 minutes. You need to know that in advance, not just turn up and hope. So you can make a plan accordingly, and maybe we can work with a retail partner and offer you a free cost of coffee as compensation for your 15-minute delay 
or a subsidized Costa Coffee. All kinds of opportunities there for shared and customized information services. So that was a very, very quick run through what I'll call the digital revolution, which is going to lay the groundwork for the energy revolution. And this is where we come back to Steve's fusion power. So what's that going to do for us? Well, let's make the assumption that fusion power is there's a breakthrough and it isn't cold fusion. And we had a chat with Steve about this earlier. If it was cold fusion, if it were to be even uh, remotely conceivably doable, it would be very easy to make very compact and, and put into every car. But of course, I th realistically, the fusion that Steve has talked about, the fusion that's likely to happen, is going to be of a scale that it's still going to pre present us, although with low-cost clean energy, huge challenges still to resolve in transmission and storage. A big problem with electricity is storing it compared with things like fossil fuel. So, transport energy media, well, we'll see the displacement of fossil fuels. Electricity, we'll see a large increase in market share of energy. We'll see indirect harnessing of electricity to synthesize non-fossil liquid and gaseous fuels. For example, hydrogen, we've got lots of superheated steam surplus as waste heat from the fusion power station. Let's use it to crack water into more hydrogen. Synthetic hydrocarbons and indirect energy storage using liquid air and liquid nitrogen. Very interesting competitors to the battery. If we've got lots of energy, we can, we can compress air and create a very high energy density storage media, which we can then reconvert into a mechanical power. And liquid non-fossil hydrogen from a superheated steam, we've already talked about. So, let's have a look at the implications on the road. Lots of pure electric powertrains, good for noise, good for emissions, particularly in the city. Dynamic inductive charging. How do we, what do I mean by that? Well, maybe we can solve the problem of energy storage by having induction charging pads under the roadway, or indeed under the trackway, if I, I'll talk about that in the next slide, where we can provide bursts of energy into capacitors on the, tr on the vehicle to power them to the next pad. And then there could be a, re a reservoir of fuel on board to allow you to transport across a piece of the network that doesn't have pads installed. So truck and, trunk and urban roads might be equipped with these pads, and then rural roads would rely on a range extender energy storage on board. Let's think about rail, rural services. Now we've got autonomous, low-cost hybrid electric light rail as a possibility. Autonomous guided electric buses. Sorry about the mix-up of buses and rails there. And autonomous taxis for the last few kilometers. On the commuter lines, we can look forward to inductive charging pads, which I've just referred to, and also adding powered bogies to improve traction in low friction conditions such as wet or icy rails. On the high-speed lines, active steering bogies to allow us to operate at higher speeds. And of course, with the kind of power we just looked at from uh, Steve's presentation, maglev for very long distance travel at very high speeds will start potentially to displace short haul air travel. On aerospace, what might be the implications here? Pri aerospace will be a priority for liquid high density energy sources, vectors. So non fossil hydrogen, possibly stored in nanometal hydride storage containers. Strong competition from very high speed rail on short haul. And potentially hypersonic long haul fleets from this fusion energy generated hydrogen. And I can't forget marine because we have a marine, uh, at least one marine uh, specialist in the audience. Uh, you see from the size of Steve's last slide, his massed low, small scale uh, uh, fusion reactor, it's perfectly possible to imagine putting those on one of those on a large container ship. So we could see fusion power similar to what we have on atomic submarines on large commercial shipping. So in summary, and now I'm going to wrap up uh, by talking about connect connectivity between the different fleets, the road, the rail, and so forth. Zero emissions, zero fatalities. Something like a 10 times infrastructure capacity increase. Low cost, high utility road transport. Low energy, zero accidents, zero emissions, very high productivity, and of course, journey time reliability. Lower f cost, faster public transport through en low cost energy, capacity utilization as I've talked about, flexibility, these autonomously driven cars, 
and intercity speed and commuting capacity. Very high modal integration. Boundaries between public and transportation becoming more and more blurred. And that's it. So thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name's Doug Gurr. I'm chairman of the Board of Trustees here at the museum, and I'm, we're your host tonight. Um, given time, I'm afraid we're not going to take questions and answers immediately now, but I think, Steve, Richard, you're able to join us outside. So please do grab them or anyone else if you'd like to follow up on these fascinating subjects. Um, quick straw poll. Can I just check um, who visited the museum in the last month or so? Great, thank you. Well, for those of you who didn't, A, shame on you, obviously. <laughs> but B, do take a look outside. We're, having, we're, we're hosting drinks in the Making Modern Communications. You'll actually see some wonderful objects that refer to perhaps more of the history. Uh, but a few very quick thank yous. First of all, um, to Simon. Um, tremendous vision in setting up these series. I hope this will be the first of a long and successful series. We're delighted to host you two here tonight. Uh, secondly, obviously, to the Minister for bringing a little bit of gravitas to our proceedings at what's obviously an exceptionally busy time. Uh, but then in particular, I'd like to thank both our speakers. And it's, it's not often you get the chance to hear not one, but two absolutely fantastic speakers. And I was particularly pleased, because um, I think one of the things you always try and do in a museum about science and technology <coughs> is you're trying to look for those things that are happening today that will be the future history of science. And I think, Steve, I cannot wait to, we cannot wait to look after and host uh, the very first fusion electricity machine. Soon, I gather. <laughs> <laughs> and Richard, what can I say? An absolute tour de force. Absolute tour de force. I listen to all of that. It's an incredibly exciting vision. The only thing I'm sitting here thinking is we're going to have to dig a much bigger tunnel between South Ken and the museum here to fit them all in. <laughs> so will you please thank um, Simon for setting it up, the minister for introducing, and both our fantastic speakers tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.